so much. I mean so much. Do you know how much is so much? So much is like from this end to that end. So much is like this much, you know? And today I'm so excited to be here because today is the day when Nazarbayev University is hosting its first TEDx event. Wow! TEDx <laughs> is the part of internationally recognized conferences which are aimed to collect the brightest ideas together. Here at the new, lots of ideas are remaining silent and today is the day when they are spoken out to you. These are the stories of success, new ideas, interesting achievements and I'm sure that you will enjoy this evening. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Josh Lane. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to uh, TEDx Nazarbayev University, a milestone event for this university. I'd like to start by saying how much I really enjoy the students here. Uh, I'm inspired by my current and previous students. And I'd like to start by thanking one in particular who worked a whole year to get the license for this TEDx um, while she was still on my course, worked very, very hard, and that student is uh, just an amazing exception and a wonderful student here. That's Akjerke Amalgadina. <laughs> I'd also like to thank her team, who are also some of my previous students, for their excellent work in organizing this conference. We have a great lineup of speakers here, and I'm just so excited about the diversity of the speakers, including two more of my previous students, Barajan and Alia Beck, who are going to talk about their inventions. So thank you very much for organizing this event. The first part of this event is entitled Technology in Our Lives and How It Improves Our Lives. Technology in our lives is only possible through academic freedom, and that is one way that it actually is working to improve our lives. Academic freedom is written in the constitution of this university. This is the first university in Kazakhstan, a former Soviet Republic, to have academic freedom written in the constitutional documents. That's important. That's why I'm here. That means we have a responsibility to share our, our ideas with the public. We have a responsibility to make our ideas alive. So let me take you through a short history uh, from the beginning of the public intellectual to the public intellectual today. I asked some students, at what university was Socrates a professor at? Some smartly guessed, I don't know. Others guessed so uh, Athens or Greece University. The truth is, Socrates was not a professor at all. He was a public intellectual. He shared his ideas openly with the public, challenged his own thinking, as well as the thinking of those in power, until those in power eventually killed him. There you go, that's good. Fast forward, no, 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 that's good. Fast forward over a thousand years. Thanks, boss. Uh, that's me, Ross, another great organizer of this event. Um, fast forward over a thousand years, the first university was erected in Bologna, Italy, 1088 AD, where, but as we can see, d despite the motto of a community of teachers and scholars, we can see from the coat of arms that the knowledge that was created there was protected behind walls. The elite powers and protected that through their elite language of Latin. They determined what was accepted as knowledge and then who could receive that knowledge. Fast forward, fast forward, ah, okay. Fast forward 500 years to AD 1517. Martin Luther, the German scholar, nailed his 95 theses to the door of Schlosskirche, or the elite church in Wittenberg, Germany, demanding that the Bible be made in a language that the public could understand and interpret for themselves, a common language. Like Socrates, he was expelled, but also like Socrates, he wasn't expelled before changing the church and the world 
forever. Fast forward to today, universities still oftentimes look like churches. They still resemble a knowledge hierarchy or a separation through protected passwords and great walls between intellectuals and the public. This is not only limited to Western universities and old European buildings, but we see that golden domes in non-Western countries still represent the power of knowledge and the knowledge hierarchy, a separation between who has power and who doesn't depends on those with knowledge. Of course, professors have replaced priests, but still teach behind pulpit-like podiums. Nevertheless, elite institutions have started to open their walls of knowledge and provide free, open access online courses called MOOCs to the public, like this one offered by Harvard University, Michael Sandel, who's pictured is the originator of this, of this course, which opens in 2013, spring 2013, on justice. But Michael Sandel has already had this course online through his lecture since 2009. Michael Sandel represents the rise of the digitized public intellectual. This is an inclusive vision. This is not a new vision. This was started over 50 years ago by the UK social entrepreneur uh, Michael Young, who began the Open University. <coughs> this vision shares knowledge with the public. You don't need to be in an elite institution or a community college. The digitized public intellectual teaches from behind any desk, any chair, anywhere in the world. But don't be afraid. I know, they're intellectuals, they use big words, and sometimes they even look scary. But the digitized public intellectual shares, shares their knowledge openly in the language that the people can understand, like our very own Howard Schwaber, who can be found openly on the internet debating the most important political issues of the day, not through rhetoric and political spin, but through logic, reason, and an ethical belief in the good. The digitized public intellectual is contactable. They're passionate about learning and teaching. As others can contact them through avenues like TEDx and Twitter, they can reach others. The digitized public intellectual creates an ever-widening public dialogue. Professor Scott Thornbury at the New City in New York City opens through blogging avenues to where professionals can engage with his students by creating ever-growing spheres of dialogue between not only his students and his ideas, but through the professional public on the internet. The digitized public intellectual reaches an unlimited community of practice. A.J. Kahn at the University of Leicester in England actually presented from distance for the reason he wanted to lessen his carbon footprint. And everything in his presentation was done online. And you can see even, you can see the original audience that was in a different location move around through Google Hangout. The digitized public intellectual puts their most important and original material online for anyone. Professor David Harvey at City University of New York uh, puts entire courses of deep intellectual material online for anyone. Not like many of the MOOCs and open online courses which offer just basic or introductory material. Prolific, controversial ideas. The digitized public intellectual asks the public to create the research questions, determine the best instruments, and conduct the research that affects them. Professor, friend, and social entrepreneur Mookie Hackley at UCL runs the Extreme Citizen Science Group, which has helped citizen groups at, in London uh, monitor noise pollution th uh, through GPS technology. They've gone further and helped hunter-gatherer groups in Africa through mobile technology protect their sacred forests. This was a topic of Jerome Lewis's TEDx talk in 2012. No longer is the monster intellectual hidden behind the protected walls 
of the elite institutions, but rather their humanity is revealed through open dialogue on the internet, where they plant knowledge, then it buds and seeds in the minds of the public, and the public then shares back that knowledge to create new knowledge, a new co-construction of knowledge. This new knowledge that's created by the public and the digitized public intellectual tears down the walls of hierarchy, particularly those walls created by money and sophisticated measuring instruments. But this is only possible through the principle of network neutrality, which keeps the internet open and free. Without this principle, private, ins private companies and elite institutions could determine what is knowledge and who gets access to knowledge. Don't take this principle for granted. The UK recently has uh, budgeted 10 million pounds or 15 million dollars to make sure that all UK academics published articles are open access online. But why should the public pay for publicly funded research? And the bigger question, who owns knowledge? So, technology is improving our lives. And I want to ask, who is the digital Socrates that shares their knowledge with anyone who logs onto the internet? Who is the digital Martin Luther that defends the public's right to have open access to knowledge in a language that they can understand? Who are the students in this room that will be co-creators of new knowledge with the digitized public intellectual? And who, at Nazarbayev University, will grow new technologies and rise up to create new ways and new forms of understanding for the public. Thank you very much.